Yep. Here we go. One more second. You guys see that? Okay. All right. Sounds good. Let's go. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Ramirez and I am the founder and executive director of And Rise. And Rise is a nonprofit organization that helps women to grow to their ultimate potential no matter what adversities they have faced in their lives. And I actually share my personal story so um, in hopes that I can compel other women to help, you know, help them through their personal adversities through mine. So I wanted to kind of go um, a little bit into like the logo that you see right here. So that's the And Rise logo, one of them at least. And the And stands for um, and that there's more to the story. Your story isn't over more over yet. There's more to tell. And then the rise is rising above any personal adversities or any type of adversities that you have faced in the past or are facing now and to rise above it. So there is, you know, I love the branding behind it. It means something. So hopefully when you see it, now you know the story behind it too. Um, and I also am a single mother. I have been a single mother pretty much since day one, since I found out I was pregnant. And uh, I also am a sexual abuse survivor. I was abused when I was seven years old by a very close family member. Uh, and I didn't realize growing up and even as an adult that um, a lot of the decisions I made were really bad. And it was actually a part, a result of the trauma that I uh, went through when I was younger through my sexual abuse. And, you know, being a single mother was kind of traumatic in itself just because it was very hard just financially doing it by my by myself mentally I did not have a big support circle to help me so I literally was on my own all the time with my daughter so that um, was very hard for me and I was young I was had her when I was 21 so I, you know when you're 21 you're already going a little crazy and you're trying to figure out who you are in the world and what am I doing here and then you know now I'm raising this little baby by myself, not knowing what I'm doing. So it, it, I was very angry at the world and I didn't know why. And then once I started going to therapy and started just changing things about myself, I started realizing like, okay, like in order to make a change in my life, I'm going to have to make different decisions. I can't keep doing the same things that I've been doing because I'm not getting anywhere. So I started going back to school uh, and I just started making positive changes in my life in the way that I think. I started thinking, you know, more positively. And then I started hanging around people who think differently, you know, who have positive outlooks on life. And that really changed my life. Um, so I was a poor single mother. And I eventually, I started, I got a debt. I was actually with $25,000 in debt as a single mother. And just, that's the only, I can only get by through like credit cards back then. So I got into a lot of debt. And by the time I was 30, I was able to get out of the debt. And then I had a lot of money left over, so I was able to start investing in real estate. I started blogging. I just became an author. I just um, graduated college. So I did a lot of things that um, I wanted to do just to be a better influence for my daughter. I didn't want her to go through the same things and struggles that I had went through. So then it brought me to Anne Rice, right? So then I started doing these women empowerment events out of my living room. And... Uh, I got such great feedback and like I said they started out in my living room <laughs> and by the third event uh, it was a free event but we sold out of 150 tickets on Eventbrite so that showed me and that actually like motivated me like let me make this into a an organization to help other women and that's what I did and that's how I am here now telling all you lovely people about it and I, I'm very passionate about it I love helping women I didn't realize um, that this was my calling until honestly the last few months when I was able to quit my job and now I'm doing this full time and I'm very, very happy about it and very passionate about it. It's something I really believe in. Um, so our mission is um, we're an organization that empowers women of all ages, colors, creeds, and backgrounds to embrace the best versions of themselves. And through and rise, women will receive the tools that they need to overcome the pers these personal adversities and a change mindset on how to view life and themselves as well. So a little bit about what we do. We do personal and professional de development workshops. We do women empowerment um, events. And I also collaborate and support women-owned businesses, which is Exhibit A here with Leanne. Um, I, I collaborate with experts to give my community of women uh, great content for their businesses, whether it be personal or professional or personal. You know, So we do a lot of... Uh, different things. Um, and actually the picture that you see right here on the screen 
is the last in-person event I was able to do. It was in February, is um, our um, Galentine's brunch. So it was, the theme was um, Valentine's themed and it was about loving your authentic self. And a lot of the women you see there were uh, trauma, have been through some type of trauma in their lives. And it was a really awesome event. And we got just great feedback, sold out of that event too. So um, I just, it just brings me such joy to see like those smiles. This was after the event. And that's not just because they're smiling for the cameras. They were like touched and they were empowered. And that is why I do this because it brings me such fulfillment to see that I can touch people's lives with just telling my story. Um, and that we also do support circles for sexual and domestic abuse survivors, uh, which is a little more, bit more intimate. And we just talk about those things that, you know, we're uncomfortable with talking in a big group of people. Um, and, and then ultimately is to empower women to be the ultimate versions of themselves. And how we give back, um, my overall like view for Anne Rise is to help single mothers with uh, college, with financial assistance for college. So we want to help them with tuition, with supplies and with childcare. There's, if you are on social media a lot, Pre-COVID, you would see that there's a lot of professors holding babies nowadays because childcare is so expensive. People have to take their kids with them to school. So, like, I don't want women to worry about that. I want to be able to help them with that. I had to drop out when my daughter was younger for the same reason. So that's why I want to help with that and providing sexual and domestic abuse survivors with therapy because I feel like in order to be that best version of yourself, you have to overcome those personal things that hold you back. Um, but currently, we're actually doing our fundraising efforts on COVID-19 and women that have been affected by COVID. Uh, as we all know, a lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of people are getting their hours cut. A lot of people are being furloughed right now. So a lot of people are hurting um, for financial assistance. And I want to provide that to women that are currently facing these things right now. Um, and we also have a, another, I'll talk about it in the next slide. Uh, we have a couple of fundraisers. Here's how you can help. You can either donate to our causes. As you can see, there's some links right here that you can copy. I can um, send them out later too after this uh, webinar. And then um, I have partnered with One Hope Wine. So if you guys haven't heard of One Hope, they are super awesome and they give back to charities. Um, so no matter what wine or whatever you choose to buy, something goes back to some type of uh, charity. So for example, you buy a bottle of Riesling, let's say, um, Riesling gives back to cancer survivors, or you buy a bottle of Merlot, Merlot and that gives clean water to, to people who live in like places where there's no clean water. So things like that. So you're giving back twice because you're already buying that bottle of wine that's um, supposed to be for that specific cause. And then any profits that Anne Rice makes, we get 10% um, of the profits back to Anne Rice. So you're giving back twice, which is super awesome. And just so you know, too, uh, attending our events, I know that this is a free event, but other events um, probably will be paid in the future. Um, and when you purchase event or tickets through our events, that money goes back to women in need. It doesn't go to the CEO's pocket or anything like that, like other for-profit um, businesses. So just remember that your dollars go back to a great cause. And um, if a donation is not possible, I totally understand, no pressure whatsoever, but do me a favor and help us out and tell your friends about us. We are a great organization um, for women and uh, we do great things. Uh, so tell your friends about us, share my social media page with them. If you can't you know, provide anything monetary, it's totally cool, you can help in other ways. And you can also become a volunteer too, if you're interested or know of anybody that is interested in becoming a volunteer. Uh, here's how to get into contact. You can visit uh, the website. It's www.womenrisechicago.org. Um, there you will see all the events and all the things that we're doing right now. Um, and if you have any questions or are interested in volunteering or want to talk about something offline, um, you can reach me directly at jennifer at womenrisechicago.org. Um, also, feel free to follow us on social. We are on um, Facebook. Um, Instagram at Women uh, Rise Chicago. I'm also on Pinterest. I think that Pinterest is just under and rise and I have a YouTube, but don't bother with that yet because it's not set up, but that's it for my social media stuff. Um, and that's it guys. So thank you for listening to who I am and a little bit about my background and what I do and, and about and rise. And if you're interested, please visit our website or contact me directly. So thank you guys.
Jennifer, are you going to, are you going to put those links in the chat maybe to make it? Yes, I could do that. I will do that right now. <laughs> Great idea. Very cool. Very cool. So I'm so it's so inspiring to hear your story and how you took something that um you know could have led you down a, a darker path but turned it into something that not only can help you but also help so many other women so i'm very yes. very inspired by you thank you thank you so much my pleasure oh should i stop share yeah okay <laughs> we're working Sorry. out our technology here folks we are <laughs> we did not practice this beforehand <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. No worries. Cool. All right. Uh, do you want me to just take it away? Or oh, yeah. So sorry, guys. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, without further ado, I was supposed to introduce Leanne. Sorry. So, <laughs> here's our keynote speaker, Leanne. Go, go for it. Thank you. Okay. I didn't want to be rude. Just like, no. You know, yeah. Sorry. I'm done. <laughs> All right. Let me share my screen here. And I'm going to go. There and we're gonna go to slideshow. Maybe in the beginning. All right. Can everybody see my slides? You can um, do. Yeah, Jennifer, you can. I'm gonna trust. I'm gonna trust that you represent the rest. So, <laughs> all right. Um, so and, and thank you so much for having I'm thrilled, Jennifer, to be talking with your people um, and some of my people. I know we've got a nice mixed group today, which is really cool and really fun. So I'm. Um, all right, so you know you don't need me to tell you that the world is changing very fast. Um, the things that we relied on just a couple, you know, just a month or so ago, especially our in-person strategies, are really no longer um, no longer viable for the moment. We're starting already to see some things open up. The question is, we don't know what's going to open up and how it's going to open up and when it's going to open up, and especially. You know, and, and um, uh, Jen and I are here in Chicago, and uh, you know we're shelter in place at least until the end of May. I personally think it's going to go a little longer, um, but uh, we can. And I think we're doing this in doable chunks, right? So I think we can mentally get to the end of May, and then once we get towards the end of May, we can consider some other things. But uh, it's going to be a little slower in the big cities here, so. And so here's the thing, you know, if you were relying before this on those in-person strategies to reach your people, then obviously we need to make a shift, um, at least in the short term and potentially some things maybe for the long term. I think um, there's a great opportunity for us here to, to look at what was really working and, and not just what we kind of thought was working. Um, I think there's all of us uh, who are business owners, you know, sometimes we get, and I, I speak for myself, Sometimes we get in a um, uh, habit of, well, I, I, I'm going to do these activities, and then we feel like we're doing the right things because we're checking off the boxes, but we don't take that moment to step back and say, did that really work? Is that something I really um, wanted to do? Or, you know, is that something that really made sense? And I think this is giving us an opportunity to do that. We'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through here. Um, by the way, if you have questions or things like that, please put them in the chat. Or there's also a Q&A tab if you move your mouse your um, cursor down to the bottom, you should see a little bar that pops up and it's got a QA, and it's got a chat. And if you can put things in there, that would be great. And I'm happy to answer them as, uh, as we go or at the end or whenever it makes sense. So, um, and sometimes I might ask you to put some things in there because I like to keep this interactive. So. so the key here and what we want to talk about, what I'm going to talk about today is just how do we pivot from this in-person world over to the uh, Zoom. Everybody's favorite platform now is Zoom, which uh, I've, been, I've been using Zoom for a long, long time. So it's, uh, it's, it's been a, an interesting transition for me to see so many friends who had never heard of it before. And now they're like, what, what is, you know, what's this, how do I work this thing? And it's all, uh, it's, it's changed a lot of, of how everyone interacts, that's for sure. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is a shifting your mindset uh, into this new virtual world. Um, how to, if you're gonna create a virtual experience, how to also create a tactile experience within that virtual setting. Uh, we'll talk about technology to embrace for your service delivery and your content delivery. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about email and the role email plays in all of this. So why your email list is more important than your social media following and then how to add people to your list without annoying them 
or breaking the law. Dun, dun, dun. We talked about lawbreakers. Um, and, uh, and of course, Q&A all the way through. So a little bit about me since we'll spend some time together. Uh, I have um, produced over 100 virtual events. I've helped my clients add hundreds of thousands of subscribers to their email list. I've got about 20 years marketing and business development experience. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a speaker, um, and I've been living in this virtual world for a while. Um, the types of events that I've hosted virtually are both what's called a telesummit. So that's a, a business, uh, it's a model where you interview like 20 speakers or 10 speakers, and then you release the interviews over a period of, of time. And that's how a host builds their email list. So I posted those. I also produced those. I've spent a lot of uh, a lot of time and energy producing those. And I've also done you know smaller events, one hour events. I've done three three day events. Um, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So I've done a lot of different things in this virtual realm. And I did also spend a year as a digital nomad. Um, this is uh, this. These were the suitcases. I was just talking with someone about this today. It's so funny how it's circling back, but I spent an entire year, um, sold 80% of my belongings um, and got rid, of, got rid of my condo and spent an entire year traveling. I don't know why that, whoop, whoop. <laughs> my computer has a mind of its own today. Um, and I uh, spent an entire year traveling the US as a nomad. So um, these are some fun facts from the trip. I went to 21 different cities, um, eight different states, I, I was planes, trains, really no automobiles. The automobiles was actually more of a rarity because I don't have a car. So, um, and I slept in 42 different beds. Um, and I have a whole other talk about that. And if you ever want to chat about that, I'm happy to. I learned a lot of lessons from that trip. So, um, so and I've also just been working virtually with clients around the world for, um, for almost nine years now in this iteration of my business. So, um, I have a three-day weekend that's called Lead Machine Weekend, and what's really wild about the how just how fast everything has changed is I have always, um, until this year, given this event uh, in in real life in person, and I was very attached to that. It was a um, it's a three-day where you come and we set up all your email marketing, and I would host them in Chicago. I did Chicago, Miami, and Denver. And, um, and I remember my coach would say, hey, you know, maybe you can do that virtually. And I'd be like, no, 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 we cannot do it virtually. You have to be here in person. Um, I need to be able to like look over your shoulder and help you with it. And I'm very attached to, the, to delivering it in that way. And then even before Corona, due to other circumstances beyond my control, my March event, right at the beginning of March, ended up being virtual. And that was just by pure happenstance. And I was like, okay, universe, like, you know, I was like, I'll give it a try. And I, and I told my assistant, I don't know if this is going to work, but we'll try it because, you know, I want to make sure I still deliver the event. And by the middle of the first, the first day, I was like, we're totally doing this virtual from now on. And it was, I found that I was still able to deliver a great experience, great results, and still able to take people um, on the journey that I needed to take them even virtually. And in fact, some things were better virtually than they were um, in person. So, um, so my next one actually happens to be next week and I'm going to be doing that totally virtually. It was great timing. <laughs> so I was able to get that under my belt before everything went completely haywire. Um, I am from Chicago. Uh, my favorite thing about Chicago right now are the Lori Lightfoot memes. If anyone <laughs> is paying any attention to them, um, I think she's, she's doing a great job and mostly the meme creators are doing a fantastic job with, um, with all the things that they're putting out. And I'm a runner and a triathlete and even an, an Ironman and I have great Ironman stories if, you ever, if you're ever meeting at a cocktail party or anytime, I'm happy to tell you wild Ironman stories. So. Um, but what I really want to focus on today is just the, the why. Why do we care? First, why do we care about virtual events? What can they do for you? Um, one thing I love about virtual events is they really can help you build your audience. Um, you know, it's nice to, to have the ability to, um, to build an audience that's not bound by geography and be able to reach out to them very easily. In fact, today, you know, this morning, some of you are on this because this morning I thought, oh, you know, um, let, me, let me just shoot an email out to, um, to everyone on my list because there are some people who I know couldn't haven't made me the prior time when I talked about this topic and and I want to expose people to Jennifer I want them to meet her I love what she's up to I love her organization so let me just throw out a note and, and 
um, allow people to, you know, the opportunity to come to this if they want. And what's great is this is now giving Jennifer a bigger audience, right? And it allows me to serve my audience in a different way um, by, uh, by hosting this virtually instead of saying, you know, I could, I could have done that if we were in person in Chicago, but I, I would guess that there's people on the call right now who wouldn't have been able to make it. Um, like our buddy Mike, we were talking to, he's in Milwaukee, probably wouldn't have driven down. <laughs> Even though we would have been worth it, Mike. <laughs> um, another great thing about virtual events, depending on how they're set up, is you can position yourself as an expert in a way that you can't necessarily, or in, in a way that is uh, um, unique. So um, this is a one a virtual event that I appeared on, and you'll see there's Russell Brunson. Um, Russell Brunson's a pretty well-known founder of ClickFunnels. Um, he's very well-known in the online world. And so for me to appear on a panel with, um, with him as well positions me in a very unique space and allows me to, um, uh, to, to uh, I don't want to say demonstrate expertise, but be perceived as an, as an expert because, because I'm on a panel along with these other people. It's four o'clock folks, so I'm not going to promise that, my <laughs> that I'm going to make a lot of sense. I know I'm going to make sense. It might be a little uh, <laughs> tongue-tied today. Um, also, virtual events allow you to you know, make money. Nothing wrong with making money. There's really nothing wrong with making money right now as well. And I know there's a lot of people who, for whom this really, really difficult financial time, um, I know there's a lot of uncertainty. Some people aren't sure um, if their livelihood was connected to a job. They don't know if they still have a job or they might be furloughed. I know there's a lot of that going on. And, and I want to be respectful of that. That's very real um, for, and I, I have friends and family who are dealing with that. And I have a lot of colleagues who are also um, still able to generate revenue and to help people and to, to grow their business. And that's, there's nothing wrong with being able to do that, even in this time. Um, there's nothing wrong, you know, we're not talking about like, Recording uh, toilet paper and selling it for a hundred dollars a roll, you know. <laughs> but there are there are um, services that we can offer that help people, and there are people who really, 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 really need what we have to offer right now. And it's okay to make the offer, and it's okay to generate revenue from it right now. Um, in fact, in some ways, there's more money available for something because you know we're not going out to eat, we're not taking so many Ubers, we're not taking trips. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people for whom they actually have more money right now than they've had in the past because they're not spending it on things they usually spend it on. And so if you are in a position as an entrepreneur to offer a service that, that can help those people with the need that they have, then go for it. Let's, uh, let's be okay with that. Um, virtual events can also help you generate content. Um, there, uh, you can um, generate audio recordings, video recordings. You can take those recordings and have them translated or transcribed rather, um, or translated, um, <laughs> transcribed into forms of content, which could be, you know, eBooks or workbooks or um, blog posts or email posts. Um, you can, uh, you know, take compilations of what you've done. You can turn things into videos, both the solos or the in-between. So there's just a lot of ways you can take content that you create during a virtual event and leverage it in a lot of different ways. Virtual events can also help you generate more speaking gigs. Um, in fact, I, I, I have been, I've, I've been generating, I've, I've booked more speaking gig, gigs in April than I have in a long time. And part of it I know is because the topics of what I speak about, but part of it too is that I'm comfortable delivering it in a virtual way. And I think um, having that flexibility has actually helped me to reach more people, which lets me serve more people, which makes me really happy. Um, and finally, it's the, uh, it, helps you, it helps you pivot. Having this in as a resource or having the ability to pivot virtually is, helps you, can help you get through this time that we're in and then also um, embrace, embrace the new opportunities that can be coming on the other side of this. So, all right, let's talk about three keys. And I want I saw some things coming through on the chat. So I just want to check. I can't know why the little chat thing is not. Oh, I hate when I'm the technology girl and I can't get the technology to work. There it is. <laughs> it's unbecoming, right? Oh, good. Jennifer, you posted your links. I'm so glad you did that. 
Um, and a mic your suite, it would have been worth it for sure. Thank you all. Thanks to everyone for being here. Cool. All right. Cool. So let's look at, oh my goodness. <laughs> the first, we're going to talk about the three keys in pivoting your business to virtual. And the first key is shifting your mindset um, and just kind of wrapping your head around, um, around what's going on. And the question that I ask that I've been talking with a lot of people about is, you know, who do you want to be? Who do you want to be on the other side of this? When we are, when we're having a conversation with someone a year from now, five years from now, even maybe just five months from now, and we're talking about remember when, remember when uh, Corona happened, remember when we were on lockdown, remember when, uh, when you talk about that time, how do you, how do you want to have, speak about how you showed up? You know, do you want to show up as the person who, um, or do you want, do you want to have look to look back and have shown up as the person who was fearful and who was constricted and who was, um, uh, you know, in that, in that down energy, or do you want to look back and, and say, no, you know what? I stepped up. I really learned some things. I took advantage of that time. Um, and that's not to say that we won't have times when the energy is down and the emotion is down and we're feeling sad or we're feeling constricted. I've certainly had that. I've discovered some new uh, flavors of Ben and Jerry. It's been one of my pandemic discoveries. Um, and I'm totally fine with that. Um, and I think the key is to uh, have those feelings, let yourself have those feelings, understand those feelings, and then see what you can do to move through and to come out on the other side so we can be who we, we truly are here to be. Um, I really feel that especially for coaches and thought leaders um, and uh, entrepreneurs, now is the time for us to step up and to demonstrate who we are and what we're all about and how we can serve our people and just do it in a little bit of a new way. Um, it, is, it is tough emotionally, I totally get that. Um, and yet there's a bigger opportunity to step into that leadership and for us also to, I think one of the, one thing I've learned so far is, uh, learning how to kind of process those emotions that are coming up and to understand what's happening and to really not get bogged down in them, uh, but to feel the, deal with the emotions, feel the feelings, and then still step up and be a leader, still show up for my clients, still connect to what I'm really on the planet to do. And so the question ultimately becomes, can this fuel you? Can you see the opportunity without being opportunistic? You know, can you, can you be the person who steps into something bigger? This, this time reminds me of 9-11. Um, I was in business. Uh, my, my first official entrepreneurial venture was, um, was actually um, speed dating business in uh, Southern California. I got stories about that too, if you ever want to. <laughs> if anyone is familiar with um, speed dating. And, um, you know, 2001, I, I launched that business in January 2001. And so 9-11 happened, of course, September 2001. September 2001 was the worst month in my business. Every, we all remember this, right? Everything shut down. People weren't traveling. People were, you know, holed up. Um, and October 2001 ended up being the best month of my business. And my business took off after 9-11. And that's because everyone's priorities shifted. And everyone had this sense. We all still have the sense of where were we when that happened. And it kind of drew people to, to reevaluate how they were spending their time and, and whether, in, in my case, with the speed dating, whether they actually wanted to meet somebody, whether they were going to make time for that in their life. And so I say that because, yeah, that was, that was a tough, you know, I had an event planned for September 12th <laughs> and, you know, and it obviously didn't happen. And it was really hard to sort through what to do and, and like how to recoup from that. And, there were opportunities that opened up for me and my business that wouldn't have opened up had that not happened. And so it's like, how could I, um, how can you kind of leverage in, in a, again, in a leverage the opportunity without being opportunistic and look at just what's going to open up for me now that might not have opened up before. I feel like the one of the opportunities here is that there's going to be when we get on the other side, right, there's questions of what do you want to take forward? What do you want to move forward with? And, and 
renew? And then what do you want to like leave behind? Kind of burn in the trash can there. <laughs> what do you want to like not, not, not take into the new way of being? Uh, you get to decide. That's the bottom line. You get to decide how, how you handle all of this. All right, so that's our mindset around um, the pivot. Uh, next, I want to talk about thinking tactile, thinking about a tactile experience. So um, one of the things that is, has obviously changed dramatically is we can't, uh, we're used to being in the room and we give the hug and like we, you know, and you, you touch something and you, 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 well, you still write with your pen. I guess that didn't change. <laughs> but you get my point, you know, there's a, there's a, feeling way to do that. Um, so it's like, how can you kind of incorporate that even into a virtual experience? One thing I've learned and uh, with my three day, I'm actually getting ready to do this uh, tomorrow for my event next week, is I sent a care package to the attendees. Um, and that's, now since that was a longer event, since it was a three day event, I, I wouldn't do this necessarily for like a one hour event, but for a higher end, like an all day event or perhaps a two or three day event, I think something like this does make sense. The package, um, which I forgot to take a picture of, I'm gonna take a picture tomorrow, <laughs> is um, it had a lanyard in it. So, you know, when if it had the thing, basically they would have received and, and picked up if they would have come to my workshop in person. So it had a lanyard, it had uh, the workbook. Um, I usually have very creative things on the table. So I sent a little um, thing of, a mini thing of Play-Doh, like a squishy ball. And, um, you know, I sent snacks because I usually, uh, I'm, I love snacks. <laughs> and so I usually have those out on the table. So I put those in the packet. Um, this time I've got to see if I can get, uh, you know, being the Chicago gal, I got to see if I can get some Garrett's popcorn. I don't know if they're still open. Um, I need to go look because I thought it'd be really cool to get the little mini popcorn bags um, and include those in the packet. So just thinking in terms of, uh, you know, how can you um, help people have something a little bit different to interact with um, that also will help them step into a role. The reason I did the lanyard was because um, I, I asked everyone, if, if you come virtually, I want you to still act like you're basically like you're leaving town. So I want you to set aside different space and I want you to, um, to tell people that, you know, you're, you're busy and not to come in and talk with you. And so it's kind of like if you wear that lanyard, it feels a little bit different when other people are around you and interacting with you because you're like, kind of like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm at an event now. Um, in the, um, just, I'm looking over at my notes. I had, um, also had them, um, uh, wear, wear, you know, not wear pajamas. <laughs> and I let them know we were going to be on video the whole time. Because sometimes, I've seen this on some Zoom calls I've been on lately, sometimes everyone's a little too, like, you know, maybe like a little too, uh, where's my thing? They're a little too comfortable. They're like a little too, <laughs> you know. Um, and I've been guilty of this myself. And so they'll either show up just completely uh, zoned out or they'll turn their video off. And so you only you only see their name or their picture or whatever. And I said, no, that's not appropriate during my event. So let's make sure that we're prepared for that. Um, no, no lurking, no lurking with the other picture in front of your thing. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, another consideration to have is just, you know, how can you, if you think about the goals of the event that you have, how can you still reach those goals but maybe in a little bit of a different way. So um, one way is the, the chat function that we have here. I do have a, um, a client who also had a three-day event that she had also for five years only ever done in person. And we did it virtually because she um, had the, the date for it was like March 25th. So it was when, you know, everything was going really, really crazy. No one was traveling. And one thing that was really cool was in that event, usually when we do it in person, um, you know, there's a, sometimes you've missed little extra conversations or there could be something going on over in that part of the room that you kind of don't see because you're in this part of the room. And, and a lot of that ended up getting captured in the chat. And the chat ended up being a really cool feature because then as someone was speaking or sharing or something like that, others were in the chat saying, oh, that's great. Or, you know, you go girl, or, hey, think about this, or giving 
people all kinds of feedback and it was more feedback than we normally would get in an in-person event because you just don't have that kind of option. So, you know, utilize, utilize opportunities like that and things like that, that you now have access to that you might not have had access to if you were in hosting a live event in not live in person, in person event. Um, another thing we did was the applause. That's what this like little thing. So since, you know, usually if you're in, in person, you can like clap and you can like make your noise and do whatever. And obviously that doesn't translate, translate here. So um, I've been at a live events where people are doing this for applause. And I really like that the visual, it's motion and it gives uh, people can get the, the sensory perception of it. Um, also, it's great to have, uh, you can still do like dance breaks. One of my clients loves to do dance breaks at her um, events, and we were a little bit sad of whether we could do that uh, virtually, but we did. She turned the music on, and then, you know, because we could see each other, we could see each other getting up from our seats and doing the dance. And then we also did some breathing exercises. So, um, again, wanting to keep everyone kind of uh, present and in touch with what's happening, we took, we took those breathing breaks and made sure that people were still getting up from their chairs and people were stretching and and doing different things. So it's just, again, getting it tapped into those goals and the results and thinking about different ways to do it. All right, and the third key is to embrace technology. Um, so part of it, of course, you know, Zoom, everybody's favorite Zoom. Who here wishes they would have bought stock in Zoom in like January? <laughs> I'm like, man, <laughs> I didn't think it was gonna be that big. Um, and uh, I think they've done very well, especially there was some hiccups with the whole, with privacy and with people bombing things, but I feel like they've, they've done well to handle like, you know, whatever 10, 100X users <laughs> they had before. Um, the other thing to think about is just your lighting and your mic. Um, I'm, I'm gonna upgrade my system as well, but um, I'm blessed with a lot of natural light in, um, in the place where I do this. Um, and you can look, there's a, a Yeti mic I'm gonna look at getting that captures the sound a little bit different. So just um, pay some attention to what things look like, what looks like behind you, what looks like around you, to make sure that uh, you're presenting in the way that you want. Um, also watch the, uh, what happens on screen. I, I you saw, I thought this was so funny, the potato boss who like somehow got the like screen thing. I think she was trying to do a green screen or trying to like change something. She turned herself into a potato during, so, you know, just be mindful. I like the, I like the looks on the faces of her like team too. <laughs> They're just like, oh my God, we really have to look at you like that. <laughs> so maybe practice, practice a little bit with that background. You can change your Zoom background. Um, depending on the version you have and depending on the um, what your computer you have depends on the how much flexibility you have with that. If you are going to do it, it's best to get a green screen and have a green screen behind you that that makes the um, uh, that makes that whole background makes you not blend with the background and that stand out. So um, I just keep a wall with a pretty picture on the background. I don't mess around with all of the the fanciness. Um, with, oh, Mary, Mary bought Zoom stock. You go, Mary. I love it. <laughs> very, very smart. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, who could have seen that coming? Um, you also want to, um, I think it's a good thing. This one I kind of cobbled from, uh, I, I found this, um, this, is, this is not my creation. Um, but I have my designer working on um, a creation like this. And I think this is nice, especially, again, thinking about your audience, right? If they're not used to using Zoom and they're, and they're not comfortable with technology, creating something like this that kind of shows them what to do or where to look or where to point um, can not only be helpful, but can also save you time. I don't know about you, but I've been on a ton of calls. Where, and actually, I kind of did this today, with, even though I use Zoom all the time. But we've all been on this call, right, where it's like we're sitting there, like we're waiting for somebody to figure out how to turn the mic on, you know. <laughs> Some poor souls over there going, move your mouse. No, move your mouse to the left. You know, um, so to avoid having to deal with that, it's nice if you can give some additional instruction to your people. 
Um, and, uh, and Jennifer, when I, I'm going to create this, because I know you're going to be doing more Zoom things. I'm actually, I'm happy to share this with anybody, because uh, I'll probably send it out to anybody who's on my email list. Um, you know, it can, I'll, I'll share it so that you guys can use it and then like, you know, um, send it out to others. I think it's a nice feature. Um, you can also use breakout rooms. This is kind of a cool feature of Zoom. Um, and if you have the, it doesn't come with the free account, but it does come with that next level up account, which I think the current rate on it is $12.99 a month. It's the pro account. Um, and it's just a setting. You, you want to make sure, the key is you want to make sure you go into your settings and you enable breakout rooms. And then if you do, what's great is um, they, you'll see them on that bar at the bottom. And you can use that as a way to like, break people off into smaller groups to have masterminds or have private chats. Um, we used it in our, um, in a retreat I did with a client where um, typically when we would have been in person as facilitators, we had a team of facilitators, we would have been kind of going around to each person and looking over their shoulder and seeing what they're doing. And we couldn't do that obviously because it was virtual. But what we did was we put each of the participants in their own breakout room and then as facilitators and coaches, we checked into their rooms with them. And that way we could have private conversations um, and, you know, and still deliver service to them. And then they could be, if they were, didn't need any help, they were like, no, thanks, see you. And then that way they could work privately, but still be in the entire group event. So they didn't have to find somewhere else to go. You can also use, there's a whiteboard feature um, that comes with that pro level of Zoom. So you could have, basically it's another attendee window um, and you can use a whiteboard. You can use it through Zoom or um, if you have an iPad, not the level iPad I have, as we were discussing earlier, <laughs> you have a newer version of it, you can have it attend and there's a whiteboard app that you can use on Zoom um, that would then be shown to everyone, much how um, I'm sharing a screen right now. So that's kind of a cool different way to um, take care of that. Another thing that we uh, that I recommend utilizing is, especially if it's going to be a longer event, is uh, a WhatsApp group, and that's just for the attendees, and that's so that you can send out messages like, "Hey, we'll be on in five minutes," or you know, "We're starting, we're regrouping now. Come back from break," or "Here's the link for whatever," and you can just kind of communicate with everyone at one time, one time, without it being a group chat function, and uh, meaning, or sorry, without it being group text. Group text, I find um, it just, it doesn't really work well for groups. <laughs> WhatsApp is much easier and it's free, so it's easy to use. So the key here again is just like thinking and planning, right? So thinking about those goals, thinking about the results you want to create, thinking about um, the, uh, how, you, how can you achieve those results in a little bit of a different way. I also do recommend, depending on how your um, event is structured and how many attendees you have, I recommend having some sort of a tech person or an assistant who can help you just so that you as the facilitator and the leader don't have to worry about, um, you know, can you see the iPad? Can you hear the music? Can you, did you send everyone a note that we're coming back? And as the facilitator, you want to be free to be present and just to be leading and, and being in your kind of genius zone and let somebody else worry about those kind of um, extra details that maybe you won't, want, you won't want to have to deal with. All right, so let's see. We got, oh, we got a chat and a question. I'm gonna check that out. Let's see, love it. Thanks, Wyatt. I like that tax bar too. I'm very excited about that, the fancy version. Um, let's see, so we have a question from Cassandra. I love questions, by the way. Be sure to throw those in there. And um, why do you find WhatsApp easier than group text? In my experience, they seem virtually the same. Um, I've heard this before, and I think you might be missing something valuable in WhatsApp in terms of the function of the features. Um, that's a great question. Hi, Cassandra. <laughs> that's a great, great question. What I found is that um, a couple different things. One is the um, it's easier in WhatsApp to share like a, um, I can do a voice, voice, voice note recording. That's one thing I really, really like about WhatsApp versus other uh, group texts. Um, if you can, you just hold the little microphone down and you can um, swing it up and I'll lock it so you don't have to keep holding the button and you can do a voice recording and put that out to everyone. And I don't know an easy way to do that in a group text. Um, it's also easier to share, um, 
documents or not documents um, links to things. I feel like it's much easier for me to, depending on where I'm copying from, to get them in, into the WhatsApp feed than in other ways. And part of the reason for that is with WhatsApp, you can, there's a desktop application you can get so that you can use it from your computer instead of just from your phone. And sometimes if I have a, a, a link to share that's kind of a quirky link that's like long and hard to copy that I just don't like finding on my phone and copying, it's much easier for me to find it and do it through the desktop application or to type if I have a longer message, sometimes I'll type it in there. The other thing I found is, and it might be because I'm an iPhone user and I, I know there's sometimes quirkiness between iPhone users and, um, and uh, Android users, but I've found sometimes I'm in a group text and somebody will answer and then the answer only goes to a few people or I'll respond and sometimes my response only goes to one person or to a few people in the group and not to everybody in the group. And I've seen that it gets just a little disjointed sometimes like um, somebody else, somebody's answering a prior thing and I, I don't know, it, it, it gets somehow broken up um, versus in WhatsApp, it's always in that one feed. And so those are, those are off the top of my head the reasons I like it a little bit better. I gotta be honest, I was a little resistant to WhatsApp when I first, <laughs> when I first was in a group and then somebody was like, let's create a WhatsApp group. And I'm like, I don't need extra stuff on my phone. I don't need another app to open. You know, why can't we just text? And what I've come to find out is if there actually are um, things that make it a little bit easier and uh, I think I can search it too. I believe I can search WhatsApp and that helps. So, um, and yeah, Cassandra, I see with your international friends, fantastic for that. Um, and so, um, so it's good for that, but, uh, but yeah, I'm getting used to it for other reasons too. The voice note in particular, uh, let's see. And you had one more question in here, which was, um, do I, I guess is that done? Let's see. Do I find most people already have WhatsApp or is there a learning curve needed? You know, that's one of those things. I'm, it really depends. Not everybody has WhatsApp. I find that more and more people do have it and, um, it's, good to uh, give instruction on just what it is and why and that it's free. And so you're actually reminding me to put a, uh, for my event next week to make sure I have a little WhatsApp um, uh, note re how to use. Just to make sure, just to, again, make it a little bit easier. Um, plus load it up. Yeah, um, so that people, yeah, just to make it a little bit easier. I think it's, it's always good to give a little bit of extra instruction, kind of like that Zoom bar, um, just because why not? Why not? All right, let's look at the chat. Um, let's see. I find it easier to share pictures and videos. Yeah, videos are too large for group text. That's so true, Jennifer. Yeah, sometimes, you know, Jennifer, you can feel free to like unmute yourself and type in. <laughs> <laughs> it's your show. Just I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> I don't mind. This is your gig. <laughs> um. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. This was. Oh, this is one of my wonderful uh, clients, Michelle. That I was talking about that I helped her with um, transforming her. She had this three-day event also. Um. That uh, she'd been delivering for five years in person, only in person. And she thought she was going to have to cancel it because everything was happening. So we saved her 20, 20 grand in registration and reduced her cost by um, like about 80%, which was amazing. Um, I think we're about to do it again too, because her next one is in June. And I'm like, I don't think we're going to be traveling by June. So, um, so now I want to talk about um, email marketing, just how that can play in to um, to this whole virtual experience, because I found that there's a big interplay um, between uh, what you can, you know, hosting the virtual event, that's one thing, and delivering your services virtually, and then email marketing is a foundational element of it that I think is also very um, uh, important to your delivery of this. Uh, and, and very fun, right? As shown by the people who are able to make it today, because they were on my list, and, I, and when I emailed today, like, hey, why didn't you show up? And then there was an opportunity. So one thing that uh, the, the reason, one, one big distinction for email, one thing I really love about it is I feel like it's the difference between email versus social media is the difference between making a phone call, reaching out to people individually. And um, social media is a little more like a billboard. 
you put it up there on the side of the road and you hope the right person drives by at the right time and they look up and they see your message. And it's really hard to know that all of those things are gonna be in place. Now with email, I'll give you, we need to make sure they open the email. <laughs> but, but at least you know you're getting directly to them instead of kind of just throwing it out there and hoping. Um, email also, if you own it, you own the list. No one can take that away from you. And as we all know, I'm sure we've all seen this in our social media, you know, if Facebook changes the algorithm, which they do all the time, or whoever owns it changes, then you can just lose your audience over, not even overnight, in a matter of an hour or two, and you have no control over that. But with email, you own it, so you always can get in touch with your audience, and no one can get between you on that. Email, I felt like we all felt the uh, important slash pain of email recently with everything that happened with uh, Corona, and that's because um, you know, all of a sudden we started getting all these emails from companies that it was like, did I, do I have any connection to you? Like, I, I was like, five years ago, did I buy? I don't remember this. Now, one reason that it was so like, what's happening was because a lot of companies and a lot of people, as a matter of fact, aren't very consistent with their email. And so one thing that I always preach is that you know, you want to be consistent so that nobody gets an email and is like, who, who are you? How did I get this? How do you have my information? And if those companies would have been a bit more consistent um, between the time that they got our email and the time that they were sending out this message, we might have been a bit more receptive. Because here's the thing, for the companies that we cared about, for the people that we cared about, for the service providers that we were connected to, we were interested in the message that we were, that they were sending. But for the ones that we didn't have that connection to or we weren't, we didn't even know we were still technically connected to it was kind of like what who are you what what i don't know i don't want this delete delete and unsubscribe that happened a lot um the but i will posit to you that the reason the reason so many companies did that so the reason we got so many of those emails was because the companies were saying we got to get we got to get this message out we need to let people know what we're doing and we know we can get them to email. We know we can get directly to them. So to me, it was still a demonstration of the power of email. It just maybe wasn't used in the best way. <laughs> um, it's really just different in terms of the results that it drives versus social media. Now, some people think this means I don't like social media. And the truth is, I do love social media. I still use social media. I use it in addition to email, not in place of. It just drives different results. Um, I always like to throw these stats in here just to make sure that we're um, uh, not talking in, a, in hyperbole. But um, one, a couple of stats I want to point out on this that I find really interesting are uh, this prefer this channel for permission-based promotional messages. 77% prefer email versus 4% for Facebook. And then um, at the bottom here, users made a purchase as a result of a marketing message from this channel, 66% email. 20% Facebook. So it's showing the um, really the receptivity and the, the different results that can be driven for using email versus using uh, social media. I think I saw a couple questions come up here. So I'm going to go check in here in the chat. Um, oh, Cassandra, it's so overwhelming to get all this email. I know. I thought of you when I started. <laughs> oh my, that's so adorable that you thought of me. <laughs> Were you like, they need to talk to me. I mean, I <laughs> um, and uh, Mike says, we had an event with 130 people. I've been sending out emails during with an offer and found my people aren't opening the emails. Are there tricks to getting them to open the emails? Oh, Mike, that's a, such a great question. Um, so there's a, a few different things that um, go to whether somebody opens an email. Um, one is just how they got on. So if you had an event that um, if you're sending to the 130 people who were, um, who had, had signed up for the event, then that's good, right? They should be like a captive audience and they know they're on the email list and all that. Um, part of it is um, the, looking at all the communications that went out. And so if you're, what I'm reading is you're saying you're sending it out with, before, uh, during and with an offer. And so your people weren't opening. One thing we could look at is the content that you're sending out, right? So, so there's a couple of things to think about. Sorry. <laughs> the, the answer's like come flooding into my head. 
one thing we can look at is what was happening in the communication that came up before the emails with the offer happened. So how warm and receptive were they to the offer that you were going to make, you know, and, and what was happening before you, you made the offer. We can also look at um, this series of emails that in which the offer was made and how the offer was made and what kind of offer you made, meaning sometimes we as the, the service provider making the offer, we understand why we're making the offer. We understand how we can help people. We understand the difference we can make. And so because we're so close to it, we don't connect the dots for the people who we're making the offer to. And sometimes we're not very clear with why should they care about it? Why should they participate? Or how will it help them if they take you up on the offer? And so that's something I, I work with clients on. I'd be, I'd be happy. I know you, Mike. I'm happy to, to um, talk in more detail with you about this and kind of just look at the look at a, a few more of the factors of what of how those emails were sent and like the responses that you got from them. Because sometimes if you're not connecting that dot, then it means that people um, um, aren't going to take the action you want them to take. And for open rates, um, one thing I just always like to look at for the open rates is, again, sometimes we can get so utilitarian with our open rates, right? Again, because we're close to it. So it's like, like you notice um, in the email that I sent today talking about this event, um, I actually, the first subject line was, you know, join me live tonight. And it's like, okay, well, that tells people there's a live event and it's timely because it's tonight. And, it was, and, and that, I'm sure, would have gotten a decent open rate. Um, cause I, hopefully my people want to see me live tonight. And after I, you know, finished writing the email, whatever I was like, what could make this more interesting to open? And so instead I changed it to, what are you doing this afternoon? And that felt a little more, it's first off a little more playful. It's a little more my personality. Secondly, it's, it's a little more enticing, a little more of an invitation. You know, what are you doing this afternoon? It's kind of like, Oh, I don't know. What am I, you know, what am I doing? What's she talking about? So um, it's kind of making that subject line, standing in the shoes of the person who's getting the message and making that subject line something that's gonna really entice them to open. And of course, and I know I don't have to worry about this with anyone on this call or on this um, event, but you know, um, this is, we, we obviously don't wanna do anything that's clickbait, right? <laughs> that's been like the big thing. And um, we just wanna make it a little bit more enticing. Um, what I recommend that you do, it's what I do, it's actually what ended up happening today. I will write the email a lot of times and then do the subject line. And I do that so that, first of all, it's very well connected to the message. I also do it because I tend, sometimes I start to write an email and I think it's gonna be about one thing. And as I'm writing it, it kind of evolves and I go off on a different train and then it, then it becomes a little bit about something else. And so um, when I realize what it's really about, then I want to capture that in the subject line. I also, just me, I love song titles. And so if you'll notice, if you pay attention to my emails, a lot of times they're a play on a song, a song title or something like that. That's just me and my goofy personality. Um, and if people, uh, if, uh, if you know the song, then sometimes it, it can, it can be something that's a little catchy or interesting, you know, I don't know. <laughs> just my, um, my way. The, there's also a, there's a, trying to think of how you can do it. If you, there's a, I'll have to think about it, Jennifer, I'll see if I can send you a link to send out to everyone, or you could just, e everyone could just email, not everyone can email me if they want to get this. I'll think, I'll think about where the resource is. But there's a few different resources that have like headlines that work or um, titles that work. And you can um, look those up and, and you can kind of like, what, how do I want to say this the right way? You can, you can find those headlines that work and, and use those as subject lines because they're a little bit more fun. I know there's a resource for that. It's not coming to me in the moment, but I know I'll find it and I'll get it to you guys. <laughs> All right. How are we doing, Jennifer? Are we good? Okay. Yeah, we're good. Okay. We got some time too, so. Cool. All right. I have a little bit more content, and then we can take more questions, and we can see where we're rolling. Um. So, email with heart is my, uh, you know, um, frame of my goodness. 
I can't get my words together today. You know, it's, hard, it's, my, uh, it's my point of view. It's my signature system. Um, it's the way that I look at email. And I'm not going to go through the whole, um, all of the um, uh, pieces today, but know that they do, it is an acronym. So the H stands for how people get on your email list. That's what I'm going to focus on right now. The E is for having engaging content. The A is for authentic voice. The R is for risk regularity. And the T is for technology. And right now, I just want to focus on this how piece. The how is so important. And whenever I talk about how, I always talk about permission. You want to make sure that you're sending emails to people you have permission to email. And that often sounds like, um, yeah, duh, I know that. And what I've learned is that um, you know, when I talk about this and I talk about what non-permission looks like, it's the easiest way for me to demonstrate permission. Then sometimes light bulbs go off in your heads because sometimes you are inadvertently not uh, non-permissively adding people to their list. So one of the biggest times I see this is the networking events. Has anyone ever been to, you can just maybe type yes in the chat, ever been to a networking event where you to talk to someone, you trade cards with someone, and then all of a sudden you're on their email list. Like out of the blue, not what you intended when you gave that card up, but it happened. Um, let me just see, I'm looking in the chat, see what happens over here. Yeah, for sure, it happens all the time. Um, oh, I see you, <laughs> Cassandra, they need my consistent communication training. <laughs> You're so kind. Um, so that happens in network. How about LinkedIn? Has anybody ever had this happen? Um, you are connection, you're connected with somebody on LinkedIn, like a first connection, and then all of a sudden you end up on, your, on their email list. Um, this started happening to me. I, knew, I knew, noticed that this was happening because my LinkedIn backend email is different from any other email. So I actually have like five different email addresses and I use them for different purposes. It's part of the way that I um, manage my time. Um, and what I started noticing was this email, which had never been publicly published anywhere, that has never appeared on a website, never appeared on a business card. I use it only for back-end business functions. Suddenly started getting on email lists. And, and what I found was there used to be, thankfully they turned this off, but there used to be a way in LinkedIn to download the email addresses for your first degree contacts. And then people would do that and then they just upload them to their email list. So not something we wanna do. Um, and I, I've, I've tweaked every setting in LinkedIn to make sure that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> but it's, so every now and then someone flips through. And the thing with this is that, you know, it's spam. Um, and it's, it's illegal. It's literally illegal to take someone's email address and put them on a list without their permission. And I know this is not one of those things where like, you know, the cops are going to come knocking on your door and you're not going to be hauled off to jail. And certainly not that much of an offense, but the bigger issue here is we all, <coughs> pardon me, we all know this saying, people do business with those they know, like, and trust. And the challenge when somebody does that is that they know you, but they don't like or trust you. It breaks the like and trust factor from the beginning. If you break that like and trust factor, then they're not going to become clients. They're not going to, um, they're not going to refer you. They're not going to do all those wonderful things that you want to do with the people that you know, like, and trust. Um, this is uh, one of my clients, Barbara, and um, she's just very cute. She, uh, she, I, love when, I love when I get emails like this, by the way, when people are like, like Cassandra, like you were saying, I thought of you, I thought of you because they need to do this. And she's like, you know, Leanne, someone just today took my card and, you know, or she got it from the event organizer and put me on her email list and she just doesn't understand how important this is. And it's like, oh man. And I, I honestly feel for um, the people who are doing this because they're uh, oftentimes, not everyone, but oftentimes they have really good intentions and they really just are trying to get their message out to as many people as possible. And somebody probably told them that it's okay. And somebody probably told them just put your message out to as many people as possible. And so they're kind of trying it that way. And it, the challenge is, those are the people who often say to me, well, email doesn't work. And it's like, well, it works. It's just you're, the way you're using it is not working. So um, I always say, you know, I love this quote with Maya Angelou, that do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, you do better. And that's what I really want to help people do is to do better and to leverage this powerful tool. So the best way to 
permissively get people on your email list is through um, a, a freebie piece of content or what's also known as a lead magnet. And um, that's the jargony term. And this is the structure that I recommend that you set up. So it basically looks at, you know, you're speaking, you're networking, your outreach, wherever, whatever you're doing, you know, meet people, drawing all of that traffic over to what I call a permission page. Permission page is a simple one page website or uh, yeah, one page of a website that has a little bit of a graphic, has an opportunity for them to add their name and their email. And then once they do that, two things happen. One is the information gets passed to your email platform and that triggers a series of emails that's called a welcome series or a nurture series. And they also get redirected to another web page where they can actually claim the content. So super simple structure. This is actually what I help people set up in Lead Machine Weekend. Um, by the way, or privately, there's many ways I work with clients, but this is one of the things I help them set up this very simple structure so that when you're speaking or when you're out there, you have a way to um, allow, allow people to opt in and to permissively get on your email list. So let's look at some ideas for lead magnets. Um, this is one thing that I find is that people get a little bit torn up into, um, you know, thinking that it's got to be like, Dun, 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 like the Magna Carta, like the best piece of content ever created in the world, or and and and, and that stops them from actually creating it. And so I want us to show you some different examples to inspire some ideas for you on what it could be, because it doesn't have to be anything massive. Um, there's a uh, this is my email with heart starter kit. Um, which I'm happy to um, actually to offer to everybody here. Um, and in fact, if you go to emailwithheart.com, then um, you'll get to this page and you can enter your name and your email and, uh, and you can get my starter kit and it has videos, it's got that overview that I just showed and it's got another cool infographic. Um, can I add this email to my list? So super simple. Um, just some content that I pulled together from different places. Um, this is another piece of content that I have. It's just a one page um, infographic, um, which is um, my email list building guide. Super simple. It's four points about building your email list so it's easy to consume. Um, and it helps people um, to understand this very important aspect of list building. You'll notice these pages are also very simple. There's a headline, there's a little call to action, your name and your email, and then I'm out. Share buttons and a video. I like videos. I keep needing to replace every single time I do this. I'm like, why do I have like the worst screen capture of myself? But <laughs> and then I need to go back and like update this slide with a better photo. We all do that. But um, at any rate, um, keeping it very simple. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, things to give away, which is um, it's like, can I add this email to my list? Talk about a utilitarian title, right? I mean. <laughs> I need to come up with a snappier title for this. But I'm, I'm a get it done kind of gal. So um, I created this, this basically has uh, 13 different scenarios in which you have someone's email and you say, I don't know if it's right to add this person to my email list or not. It walks you through whether you can and why. So just a simple infographic. Leanne, would, would you be able to send that when part of like, offering of course because <laughs> well, i like that too because i think that would be very useful for me <laughs> yeah which, which one did you want the email with heart or the list building or the um the last slide you had was the list building one that one yep that one, yeah yeah all right i'll also send you a uh my a pdf of my slides also okay. so that everyone has that so plus let me make a little. I mean, I wrote down the email with heart, but if you want to send that too, but I already wrote it down. Up, so I got okay. to <laughs> Link, and there we go. And plus, can I add? All right. Absolutely, of course. Happy to send those out. Thank you. <laughs> um, here's one I have. Uh, it's a checklist. Um, checklists are great freebie to give away. Um, and it's you know, think about your audience and what they need and how you can help them. Um, so with the checklist, what's really cool about this, I, I do um, produce virtual summits at some of the virtual events that I do. And there's a lot of different things to do in a virtual summit. And so what's nice about this checklist is someone could take it and they could go through and they could, oh yeah, I have this, 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 and they could, they could use it 
um, to help them create a great virtual event. They could give the checklist to somebody else to help them also create a great virtual summit. Or what's really cool is they can look at it and say, wow, this looks like a lot of work. Maybe I can call Leanne, see if she'll help me with the virtual summit. So as you'll, as you'll notice through these, one of the things that you wanna pay attention to is does it help somebody, does it give them a quick result, and does it create the next step for them? So um, checklists are great for that, and really probably pretty easy for you to put together depending on what you're doing. Here's a uh, video series. This is one of my clients who's a dating, dating coach. And so she does a, um, a three-part video series. She's got a theater background, so she likes doing videos and doing all that. So it makes a lot of sense for her delivering her content that way. Um, this is Marie Forleo, really well-known um, coach. And she's got an audio, very, very simple, an audio. Uh, Chipotle, I always throw this in not only because I like Chipotle, but because um, really if they're, if they're offering you, you know, points or rewards program, it's really just a, a, a great reason for them to get your email address so they can build up their email address. And I also like to show this page because, you know, there's a multi-million dollar marketing department behind Chipotle and they still have a super simple page. It's got a picture and it's got a little call to action and a headline there. Very, very simple. Uh, quizzes are a great one. Quizzes are great if you're a little bit more established and you kind of have your content. There's some quiz software that you can use to um, do that. People love to find little things out about themselves, right? And love to answer questions and then get a personalized report. So they're a wonderful um, freebie. Here's another checklist. What I like about this is this woman trained a VA virtual assistant and she knows that her audience, virtual assistants, love to check things off. They like to and make sure they go through the process and do all that. And so a, a checklist makes a lot of sense for the audience that she's serving. And that's something I always say to keep in mind is not only how, what do you want to create, but who's the audience that you're serving. This is a, a sample proposal. Here's a spreadsheet, insurance quote, um, even virtual events uh, or in-person events, any kind of event. Those are also a lead magnet in the sense of exchanging content for someone giving their email address. And I always like to show this whoop, world, whoop, whoop, uh, world Series of Poker, not because I follow it at all, not World Series, poker, um, uh, uh, poker, poker news. <laughs> it's just because they have a terrible call to action over here with the join our email list, subscribe to our newsletter. Nobody wants to do that. But get the Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Texas Hold'em for free. That's a fantastic lead magnet for poker news. Uh, this is uh, one of my clients and colleagues and friends, uh, Marianne, and Marianne used this structure that, um, that I just talked about, that whole structure with the webpage to go from zero to 780 subscribers with her email list. And people love her emails. She's, she's awesome, I love her dearly, and she's got great personality, and, and but she's really been able to cultivate um, her audience and her followers through her email to the point where they're, people are forwarding them all the time and they are, um, and she's gotten business out of it. And most importantly, she's been able to get some introductions and some opportunities that she wouldn't have had otherwise. So the keys with those lead magnets are to make them easy to consume and they solve a problem for the, the person who's getting it and that it generates a result for the person fast and that it ideally creates another problem. So it's another step for them to come back to take the next step with you. Um, let's see, so hopefully you're now having a new loving relationship <laughs> with your email, but if you're a little bit confused or have other questions, I know there's a couple questions, I'm gonna grab it in there. Um, what I'd like to offer to everyone is just a, an e-strategy session with me, which is just you know 45 minutes. Um, I can answer questions that you have. I do know that I'll give you some clarity, so I'm really, really good at that. I can give you an understanding of how you're using email in your business and whether it's getting the results that you want and, and what to do in order to change that. And I know that I can give you an insight. I've just, I've been, um, got 20 years of marketing and business development experience and almost as many years coaching, um, business coaching or marketing coaching in some format. And so um, even for people who, even if we don't talk about email sometimes, <laughs> I can always offer some sort of insight that can help you take your next best step. And that's also what we're talking about. And so 
you want to do that, you can go to timewithleanne.com and then, um, and just, you know, you have access directly to my calendar, which I'm making a note to myself now that I need to make sure I update. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, let's go on there, grab some time, and then we can have our chat together here. And let's see. And that's it. I'm going to do, I know we have a couple questions. I'm going to take a little drink of water. Um, uh, let's see, Jen. Email discussions interesting. I felt that if they're providing me with their email address for an event, Eventbrite, then I can add them. What if we have language in there that says something like, by signing up for this, you'll be joined to my list? A um, great, great question, Jen. Um, one of the things, I'm a lawyer by training, and so one of the things that I always like to um, have, uh, like to talk about is what I call the expectation of email. And so, uh, you know, in the Fourth Amendment and the legal circles, all my, all my lawyer friends get this joke, but <laughs> they have the expectation of privacy. And um, so it's the expectation of email. Would they expect to get an email from you? So, yeah, Jen, if they sign up for an event with you on Facebook, on, on Eventbrite, then for sure they would expect that they're going to get an email from you. And so absolutely you can add them to your list. If they join your Facebook group, that one is question. Um, because they haven't given, they haven't given you their email directly. Yes, they've joined your Facebook group, but they haven't taken that step. And so without that step, I wouldn't add someone to your email list. So, um, so I feel like the, the, the examples you gave give, go in two different directions. Um, and if you want to talk about that, um, if you want to have a conversation around that and maybe talk through some specifics, then I'm happy to do that. Um, I, I actually have a question for you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's say you know how Facebook has the groups in Facebook, right? And you can ask a couple questions or have people um, submit whatever questions you want them to answer. Can you say in there, can I have your email for email purpose or for like to get on my email list? Yeah. What is that? The, what I would do is that's why I actually help people create that structure, that lead magnet structure, right? Because then when you're, instead of saying, give me your email, because that feels a little bit, and I know you have a good heart with it, right? Right. And, and you have a good intention when you're saying like, hey, why don't you give me your email and then I can put you on my list. Something just right. feels a little bit like uh, uneven about that. And mm -hmm. so instead, that's why I like that lead magnet structure, because it's like, okay. you know, and, and especially if you can reference it, right? So. Um, so like when I actually have people sometimes add me, add me to their email list without permission. Lord, you know, that's a thorn in my paw. But <laughs> that's one of the reasons I created that, lead, that um, infographic that said, can I add this email to my list? And mm -hmm. so what I do is I send it to people sometimes when they ask a question about it and I'll say, hey, or if they do it without permission, and I'll say, hey, you might not be aware that there's actually a different way to do this. And so if you're interested in learning a different way, go over here and I send them to that page, then they enter their name and their email and then they're on my list and, and it's clean. And so for a Facebook group, you could say, hey, do you wanna join this event, right? That's the reason for people to give their email. Or you could say, hey, um, I've got this 10 tips or these five tips or this whatever that addresses what you're talking about. Answer the question, right? Because it's annoying if you're in a Facebook group and somebody goes, oh, just go over here and get on my email list. Mm -hmm. like you know without answering the question so it's like answer the question and say and if you want more um or if you want to know xyz you can go over here and get on my list and that way they do and that lets okay. people who are really interested to it does that make sense yeah yeah totally let's see oh paul asked me do i know um uh david of do it marketing he's very similar but i don't know david but i feel like a friend of mine knows him that name sounds really familiar to me, um, but I do like that approach. Um, let's see, and Tra oh, Tracy, you're so sweet. So give you great clarity, even on the first call. Tracy and I had such a great, such a great call. Um, thank you, Tracy. Um, all right, Cassandra, um, you might've answered this. I don't mind answering questions again. Um, when I've spoken to you in the past, what are your thoughts about having people have the double opt-in, if it's better or unnecessary? Can you talk about that? Sure, pardon me. Um, that's a great, great question, Cassandra. So first, let me just explain what a double opt-in is versus a single opt-in. Um, so you know when you go to a website and you um, enter your name and your email, and then sometimes they, they go, 
you have to go to your email and open up another email that says, yes, I really do want this. That's a double opt-in, two steps. I enter my name and my email, and then I had to go open this other email and click yes. You wanna do a single opt-in, which means enter your name and your email and then get right to the content. And the reason you don't wanna have people take that second step is 50% of the people won't take the second step. And then you can't, they're not on your list. They're in this weird purgatory <laughs> that, that you don't have access to because they haven't taken that second step. So the reason people will set that up sometimes is, or the reason uh, people advocate for that at times is because the, the concept is if somebody takes that second step, then they're really truly committed and they really want your information. And so the people, the 50% who take the second step are like gonna be great because they're engaged. The challenge is, first of all, 50% of people won't. And the reason they won't is not necessarily because they're not engaged or not necessarily because they don't want to or they don't, you know, aren't that interested. It's because you get in your email box and then there's a hundred other things in there or that email sometimes ends up going to spam and people don't see it in their spam folder or, um, you know, or they just get distracted. I mean, if you're like me, sometimes I, this literally happened to me today. I went, I opened up a tab, I went to a website and then I was like, what did I go here for again? <laughs> and so we just, we get distracted. And so if you can keep it to the single opt-in, the great thing about that is somebody enters their name in their email because they want to get that content from you. You send them directly to the page with the content. They're the most interested right then. And if you can give them what they want, then they engage right then. Then they read whatever they were reading. Then they listen to the audio. They watch the video. They look at the PDF they start to consume your content fast and you can much more easily than you've got their attention. You can lead them to the next step or, or just even just start building that relationship with them. You don't want something that's going to be a barrier to building the relationship. So that's why I like single opt-in instead of double opt-in and it gets better results and just also lets you just start engaging faster. So hopefully that makes sense, Cassandra. And uh, there we go. And Dwight says, welcome to the, thanks for the invite. You're, you're welcome. My pleasure. Um, I mean, great questions, everyone. Ooh. Those are really good questions. I was about to ask some of them that I already asked. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Does like anyone else have any questions before we go that you might want to ask? Either myself or Leanne. Oh, I think we got another one. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what an awesome group. This was so much fun. Yes, thank you everybody for coming. Just want to ask one more time, making sure no questions. All right. <laughs> cool. Well, I will send an email to everybody with um, some stuff that I'll send some links and some stuff that I asked Leanne to give to us. Um, yeah. And thank you everybody so much for coming. I hope you guys found this uh, useful. I know I did. <laughs> so thank you, Leanne, for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for coming out. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's just really uh, fun experience. That's, I love talking about all this, so. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting, it really is. I, I think it's so interesting. And like I, I did your webinar last week and I was like, wow, I would have never known half of this stuff. <laughs> Very useful. Awesome. Yes. Thanks, sister. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. All right. Thank you, Mike, for coming by.